Hey, it's Lauren, and I thought in today's video we could try something a little bit different, which is kind of going over some news headlines that are making waves in the book space, in the publishing space. I'm gonna kick off this video by talking about three major headlines and then wrapping it up with a few smaller ones towards the end. The first headline is that traditional book sales actually decreased in 2023. And the Association of American Publishers, also known as the AAP, recently released its final sales estimates. Book sales were slightly down compared to 2022 in terms of dollar amounts. However, the number of overall units declined by nearly 6%, which means that most likely publishers kept revenue up for book sales by increasing their prices. I don't know if you've noticed that if you've been on Amazon or if you've been at Barnes and Noble or your local bookstore or anything like that. But a paperback, I, I want to say used to be between like 15 to maybe $17. Now it seems like, you know, a paperback is like $20 and a, and a hardcover is like $25. It's, I don't know if you've noticed that price increase, but it's very interesting. And that has to do with uh, traditional book sales, it looks like. So these are books that are coming out from presses and publishers. There's also a database known as Circana Book Scan. It, it was formerly known as Nielsen Book Scan, but either way, they are responsible for tracking 80% of book sales in the physical format, I believe. And I'm going to double check on that. They're the most accurate representation of sales in the United States specifically. And the only thing is they don't include, you know, circulation counts at libraries. They don't necessarily count ebook sales. They don't count any books that were gifted or sold at conferences or anything like that. This is like sales from bookstores, from online retailers, all that stuff. Data from the AAP shows declines across all four major categories, and these categories include adult fiction and nonfiction, as well as children and YA, young adult fiction and nonfiction. So it looks like all sales are down for all four of those categories. The only exception though, uh, is Penguin Random House, which is one of the big five publishers. It's actually known as, all, all these publishers are known as the big five. And this includes, of course, Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, Hachette, Macmillan, and HarperCollins. They're all the biggest publishers in the United States, some of them arguably the world. And they, Penguin Random House, reported that sales for them were up by 8.5% during the first half of 2024, 13% of that for profits, which is pretty amazing. It makes me wonder, I don't know if they individually judge the prices for their books or if there's like some universal something somewhere that does that. I don't know. A lot of people think that the cause for this is due to acquisitions as well as some organic growth. Penguin Random House um, also increased its stake in source books, which is a mid-sized press here in the Chicago area. They're actually based out of Naperville, which is I want to say southwest of the city. I've only been there once or twice. They increased their stake in source books to 75% from 35% this past March. So that probably highly contributed to their increase in sales because they increased their stake in this publisher known as source books. So that's really interesting stuff. Um, it's I wonder when it when they're just going to outright buy them. I really don't know. Um, if you're ever looking at getting published through them, you're you know you're going to somewhat sort of be associated with Penguin Random House, so that's kind of cool. The second bigger headline in the news is that Barnes & Noble has been restricting certain kinds of content from their online store. This might affect some indie authors, uh, but those that it does affect, it's going to be a very, very small percentage. So for a little bit of context, this summer Barnes & Noble delisted thousands of self-published titles online without warning in an effort uh, to reduce low quality books and even some erotica books that it finds unacceptable. Now, books as a whole, as an industry, is known for being extremely subjective. If you've ever tried to pitch yourself to an agent, to a publisher, you might have found that, oh, your books are not really what we're looking for. What does that mean? I don't know, only they know. And it's the same with, you know, the business and the sales of books too. It's very, very subjective. What is considered, you know, too erotic is gonna be different from someone else's definition. But a lot of this has to do with like consent or the nature of the story, or even if there is a narrative tied to it at all, it's a really fine line. And they actually started limiting its their accepted material back in 2017, and this has included both print and ebook formats. So specific categories that it's been gradually reducing includes, of course, erotica, public domain works, summary titles, which I guess have a history of not really being that great, and any books that are suspected of AI. It seems like, you know, this is something that is kind of a concern for authors and has been a concern for authors and even publishers, and now it looks like bookstores. I really don't have an answer to that, but 
you know, it's good that they're at least keeping keeping an eye out for that kind of thing. Man, some, sometimes though with AI, it's really, sometimes it's just hard to tell. Draft to Digital is a publisher that works pretty heavily with Barnes & Noble's online store. They are also one of the biggest distributors for self-published authors, um, and only a small percentage of their authors or titles will be affected by this change. Supposedly an email was sent out to authors uh, or some kind of communication was established with authors with specific instructions on how to get their titles reinstated. So if you got that email, if you have already published your book and you work with draft to digital you may have gotten an email from them um, if you uh, if, if your book has been affected. But out of the nearly 1 million titles that D to D draft to digital distributes, Barnes and Noble's changes may affect roughly 10,000 of that, which comes out to about 1% of titles. So it's not a huge concern. It's just something to be aware of if you're already an author out there um, or if you're wanting to write a book and, and, and publish it through a distributor like draft to digital The COO of draft to digital his name is Dan Woods. He also commented on this by saying, I know authors get frustrated because it's very hard for us to define what is and isn't allowed. Like I it's it's books are very subjective. Like I said, they always want black and white rules. No one in the business gives us these exact rules. So we are kind of playing it by ear, which I guess kind of goes, goes along with what I was saying. As far as what's selling, let's talk about Romanticy. This has got to be one of the most popular titles uh, currently selling on Amazon Kindle specifically. I know people have different feelings about Amazon, but there is no denying that Amazon is one of the most popular e-retailers out there for books specifically. And when you have a Kindle, you know, and like an e-reader, something like that, and pieces and parts are compatible, it just makes it really easy for buying. So that's why we're talking about it. So a bit of a refresher, in 2023, Amazon made a bunch of changes in how books get categorized and how many categories indie authors can apply to their titles. If you're getting ready to self-publish or if you have already self-published, you may have noticed this change. I feel like Amazon makes all these like, like changes super, super frequently. I don't know why. Um, I work with a woman who's like a wizard at like self-publishing stuff. She just knows so much more about that than I do. And she's always like complaining about like, oh my God, it seems like every week Amazon's always changing something. So I don't know if you've noticed that for those of you who have already self-published out there, but either way, they now require authors to use Amazon own, Amazon's own store-driven category selection. So back in November of 2023, modern trope-based subcategories were added. Some of these included gothic time travel, rom-com, romantic comedy, Amish, and even rock star romance. So these are like really specific. But basically, re relating to romanticy, the gist of it now is that romance, because it's been so popular for the past, I don't know, however many months or even the past year or so, it has added 35 new subcategories now up from the previous 20. Amazon surveyed their authors and asked and asked what they thought about their current categories. And it's speculated that, quote, whoever shouted the loudest got served, right? So, you know, you ask the people what they want, whoever shouts the loudest, you're going to serve that people. So they bumped up 35, bumped up their subcategories for the romance genre to 35 versus the previous 20. And this I did find really interesting. You may have like all of these really popular books, right? Court of Thorns and Roses or uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Yaros. I don't know if I pronounced her name, her name right. Fourth Wing or, you know, Jennifer Armentrout, any of those like romantic, really, really popular ro romantic type books. You might be thinking, you know, man, this would be really great as a series or as a movie. Why, why am I not hearing anything about that? It's so popular. Well, so far, TV and movie executives have been not as energized as readers over the category, which I find super interesting. They suspect that part of the problem is that the industry is undergoing cost cutting measures that make it harder to produce the fantastical worlds created by authors like Sarah J. Moss. I, I, I find this stuff really interesting. Like, like the book to movie pipeline is so interesting to me. And there's a quote by Matt Damon I'm really going to try hard to find. And he kind of commented on this and I thought he did a really good job of explaining it. And he was saying that back in the nineties, you know, when, when he got into the movie business with Goodwill hunting, you know, and all of that, he was saying that it was really great because you could take risks because you not only had movie ticket sales to rely on, but then after that you would have a second wave of uh, sales from the DVD sales. But now everything goes from production to streaming. It seems like it, it feels like only a select few make it to the theaters and then after the theaters, then it also goes on to streaming. So I don't know if that's part of the reason, but I know as a whole, like the industry as a whole, I feel like that lines up with 
what I'm experiencing as a consumer pretty darn well, because I don't know squat about what it's like to be on the other side of the camera. I only know what I watch. So I find that really interesting. I don't know if that would be enlightening for some of you. Some of the leading subcategories on Amazon include contemporary romance, romantic comedy, sports, billionaires and millionaires, and even anti-billionaires, which I didn't know what that was. And apparently that's finding joy in the mundane and romanticizing the small domestic moments of life. So that's kind of cool. I haven't heard of that subcategory before. Later in life, romance has also grown by 67% in the last year and overlaps at times with women's fiction and some beach read titles. So if that's a book that you're wanting to get pitched, uh, or you have a book that you're working on that kind of fits that category, that's good news for you. Other growing romance niches include small town sports, mafia, polyamory, gothic, bisexual, and workplace. Ebook prices have risen from an average of $4.99 in January of last year to about $6.15, $6.15 in July 2024. So it seems like there's just price increases all around, big shocker, right? And 80% of successful books in the romance category are actually part of a series, which makes a lot of sense. A series are known for kind of doing pretty well because if people like one book, they're gonna wanna read books two, three, four, and five, or however many there are. So those are some of the bigger headlines. A few of the smaller ones that I just kind of briefly wanna to touch on, I think they're just good little bullet point size nuggets, you know, just you know, super, super short and sweet type stuff. So the first one is that uh, a few new publishers have recently launched. The first one is Horned Lark Press, which is a Canadian publisher of short science fiction and fantasy. So they might be looking for submissions. If you're looking for a publisher to pitch yourself to, um, these might be some potential options for you. And Horned Lark Press seeks books that are anti-monarchist, post-capitalist, decolonized, and anti-authoritarian in general. <laughs> Submissions for this also open in 2025. The next one is Compass Rose. They seek to work closely with independent bookstores to acquire, publish, and market books. So it looks like these, the, this, they, they work more with like bookstores rather than authors specifically, at least from the information that I have right now. The founders are actually former US politicians turned novelists and a former American Booksellers Association CEO. They will publish one book per month, both fiction and nonfiction, and they have formed an advisory board of 11 booksellers who will offer editorial input and promotion ideas, which is really great because I feel like if there's anywhere where publishers fall short, um, it's generally with the marketing and promotion. I feel like authors, especially new ones who've never been published before, I think they they think that they're gonna get a lot of support from the publisher and oftentimes I feel like they tend to be disappointed. So that's kind of cool that they have something built into that. They're gonna pay outright stipends to booksellers to quote, recognize the vital role they play in their communities and the collective literary world. So that's pretty cool. The third and last newer publisher in the news is a new imprint at Mango Publishing called Books Save Lives. And it's a Florida based indie publisher known for its nonfiction. Every season it will release at least one book intended to change lives and the first title is called Reasons to Live by Juliana Bruno. So that's pretty cool. Finally, as far as marketing and promotion goes, small things that are in the headlines, author Nate Silver, who also runs a Substack, released a new book and says that his newsletter benefited from a lot of those sales. And he says that he calls this the Substack effect. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about that and read his article, I'm going to leave a link to that down below. I don't think it's paid. I'm going to double check, but feel free to check that out if you want to learn more about that. And then finally, this is no surprise to me personally, but social media has entered a lean back era where people go on social media more to be entertained rather than to actually connect with people. And this leads to professional and full-time content creators, right? I feel like the only thing that's really kind of social nowadays are like groups. If it's like a group on meetup.com, that's usually where I hang out or like Facebook groups or something like that. But people have different feelings about Facebook. I get it. It doesn't yeah, it, yeah, so there, there's a lot that could be said there. But um, if you're looking for a community of people, I recently started a group on Meetup. I do a lot of webinars and stuff on there. It's very, very new. It's called Content Marketing for Business, Small Businesses and Entrepreneurs. I really like hanging out at the fulcrum point between books and business. So if you wanna learn more about the technical side of books, what you can do with the book, all these like really cool possibilities, you know, marketing and promo wise, you should definitely check that out. Otherwise, that's all I have. I really hope you found this useful. Otherwise, that's all I have. I'll see you in the next video. Take care until then. See you later. Bye.